John Workington from Michael's Camera here. I'm joined by Quinn Rooney, or join, uh, Quinn, Quinn Rooney from Getty Images, or Getty Photography, is, uh, is with me today. He's just given a fabulous presentation on uh, sports photography, showing all of his amazing work that he's done at the Olympic Games and the tennis, gymnastics, all sorts of great things. So he's given a presentation here in the Michaels uh, Theater, and uh, we just wanted to sit down and have a little bit of a question and answer session with, uh, with Quinn. I've prepared a few questions, and if anybody wants to submit a few questions on Facebook, hopefully we'll be able to get those things through, and if not live, we'll be able to follow them up in the comments. But. Uh, Quinn is here. He's got some uh, fancy Nikon gear or Nikon gear on the table in front of us. And of course, he's sponsored by Nikon. And our Nikon rep is with us today as well, standing in the background, overseeing everything. She's always a uh, welcome presence here at Michael's Camera. Anyway, so Quinn, uh, I've just prepared a few questions in advance, and I think you've already shown them to you, so we're not uh, out here to broadside you or anything. Yeah, but uh, right. we just want to talk a little wee bit about uh, photography and uh, what gets you excited, what you're doing, a little bit about your history with it. Sure. And uh, so one of the questions I like to start off with is just asking people, what's in the camera bag today? Uh, what's in my camera bag? I have uh, two Nikon D5s, a 400mm, uh, 2.8, um, 70 to 200, uh, 2470, a 1.4 converter, and a flash. A flash. Well, that's a relatively heavy camera bag. That is, yeah. And, and that's what you just have for just family snapshots, this, right? This is my small pack, believe it or not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, often I'm at my, a lot of sporting events, I've got at least two bags worth of gear. So, uh, especially uh, if I'm carrying the 600 or something, I'm often uh, go to the second bag and I'll quite often have a third or fourth body uh, if I'm going to do remotes or something like that. So, uh, definitely the, uh, the back is feeling it these days from yeah. carrying all that equipment. Well, we have to suffer for our. That's art. right. That's you know, right. The, uh, the, that's the, what the, we go through to get that shot. Yeah. The uh, the, the big gear is heavy mm -hmm. and it produces brilliant results, that's which you right. of course have showed us. Uh, now, getting back to your early days, so what was your first camera? Uh, my first camera was actually bought from here in one of the the windows here in Michaels. It oh was wow! As a, a secondhand uh, Olympus OM, I want to say OM30. But does that sound right? It was Olympus OM. Film camera. I, I can't even remember the exact model. OM10, perhaps. Maybe that might be the one. But yeah, uh, yeah bought from the windows here, and uh, I was lucky enough. My mum and dad bought me that when I uh, started at uh, Melbourne School of Art and Photography. So, what year would have that that been? Uh, I think it was '93. Okay. '93. So, yeah, I've been in the industry, yeah, a bit over 20 years now, mm -hmm. which goes very quick. So, was there any photography in your family? Uh, my grandfather was actually uh, heavily into photography, so he had a lot of um, medium format cameras. So I remember him, when I was playing sport growing up, he often would come along and take photos of us. So definitely uh, a bit of his influence. And I used to, he used to have a um, dark room in his little uh, laundry, which I used to be able to play around with. So definitely he was an inspiration for me when I first started. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. So, uh, so he liked medium format. Did, was there anything else that uh, that he was working with? Did he have anything uh, crazy esoteric or? No, no. He had. Uh, I've actually got some of his uh, old cameras. I, I keep now up on my uh, up on my uh, cupboard, I guess you'd say, but uh, as memories. But no, he had a nice. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think which which model he had, but uh, it escapes me at the moment. But uh, yeah, he had nice medium format cameras and used to like doing the, the black and white printing at home. Wow, well that's really exciting. Who, so in your actual immediate family, who was the sort of the keeper of the family memories? Was it your mother or your father? Uh, I wouldn't say we're excellent at it, but my mum has a, a very big drawer full of photos. Right. So, um, well, it's your job now, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm probably the worst one in my family. I'm, I'm very keen to take them, but it's that effort of filing them and making sure I'm, they're put in the right place. So my, uh, <laughs> Lovely partner Annette, she's uh, the, the organized one who's very good at making sure they're in the right folders so I can find them. Yeah, I, I don't think that problem's unique to you. I think no. every photographer's <laughs> got a problem. We're really good at taking them, we're very poor yeah, when it comes yeah, to that's right. that's correct. saving and I'm glad I'm wherever they go. That's well, it's because right. they all have a number. I mean, yeah. if only the camera could just say, this is a picture of Fred. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we might that'll get come, that one day. Maybe yeah. that'll come yeah. someday. 
Well, obviously, you've got a lot of experience at shooting at, at premier sporting events, and you showed us some beautiful samples from your, your talk that was just ended a half an hour ago. And I think most of the people at Michael's Camera that uh, come to see these presentations are very excited about uh, you know top-tier photographers. They get to travel all over the world, shoot the premier athletes, and of course, you've got a lot of experience shooting at the Olympic Games. So. We know that when the Olympics come around every four years, and on the odd, on the odd cycle, it's the Winter Games, so that's coming up in Korea, and of course, the Summer Games are coming up in uh, 2020 in Tokyo. The camera manufacturers love to bring out their top-tier gear and get this stuff featured at the Olympics, and I'm sure you're always looking forward to the new gear when it comes out, and it gets to you probably a little bit earlier than everybody else for <laughs> testing. So yeah. what, uh, what's the, what do you think's coming down the pipeline? I mean, I don't want any trade secrets or anything, yeah. but we know that uh, the, the big brands, uh, Nikon, of course, is going to, you know, the, which you, who sponsor you, will have some amazing things. Do, are we going to just see frame rates continually growing? Are we going to see resolution keep growing? Are they going to make, is there, is there crazy lens technology that's around the corner? Like, what do you, what do you think the future holds? Uh, it, it's, that's a big question, which I don't know, but, um, like you said, every Olympics there seems to be a new model of camera comes out and it's always exciting. It always amazes me actually that we keep increasing these frame rates. Um, I think, I guess the, the latest cameras too, you look at the ISO range, um, I was just speaking to someone before about, you know, being able to shoot at 8,000 ISO these days when, you know, three or four years ago I wouldn't go over 1,600. So mm -hmm. I, I guess I can see those things improving. Um, I think probably definitely, um, the tele, telephoto zoom. So we've got at the moment the two to 400 or the Nikon's just brought out a two to 500. So I think probably that area will continue to grow. Um, but I, I think probably the big thing that's gonna be happening, say, especially for Tokyo and the Olympics is robotics. I think uh, Nikon's bringing out some, some robotics. So we'll be able to actually control cameras through the computer. So especially for overhead spots or even uh, underwater photography, which oh, I'm quite yeah. passionate about. So um, uh, the ability to yeah, be able to uh, focus, change the direction of the camera under the water will all be controlled by a, a ro robotic. So I think that's very exciting about uh, What's, what the future holds. Well, you've certainly, and you've got one on your screen right now yeah. here, yeah. Uh, you, you've showed us some brilliant underwater uh, uh, samples. Uh, and of course, as you were explaining in your presentation that you had to get the scuba gear on to get down into the pool to just change any simple thing. Once it was, you know, I guess it was it suction cupped or weighted down to the bottom well, of the pool? Down, yes. I mean, that was that. It was yeah. sort of set and you had to just, you know, hope that uh, your subject gets into the frame. Right. I That's could it. certainly see the excitement of having some robotics, yeah. although maybe you, you'll miss the scuba gear. I'm not too sure. Uh, <laughs> I do quite like the old school. So we, we did, for example, uh, in Rio, we had robotics there. So, and that's, um, that definitely makes it makes it a lot easier. I, I quite like the old school way of uh, it's, it's just a bit like the film days of mm -hmm. actually trying to project what you what you're going to get, and, and it's the excitement of when you do pull your camera out, you, you get to see the result. But um, definitely, robotics make it a lot easier, and uh, exact, uh, especially for speed of getting images out too. So um, we have the, these cameras will be uh, tethered directly back to the computer. So again, we. Uh, get photos out a lot quicker mm -hmm. uh, rather than like w the way I'm doing it is uh, yeah having to wait till the end of the session to get the camera out. When we were just talking about the techno technology that might be coming down the pipeline and you were talking about you know the new Nikon zoom this uh, 200 to 500 yeah. this has sort of been this classic uh, question with photographers for years you know primes or zooms and of yeah. course you know the zooms just keep getting better and better but at the you know super tele range Historically, we've always been using prime lenses because the zooms in those ranges have just been so heavy. But with new manufacturing techniques, new glass formulations, uh, there's a lot of magnesium used in the in the barrels of these lenses these days. The zooms are getting much much uh, lighter. Uh, is that something you're looking forward to? It would, or do you still have a love for the prime, or would you just say, oh boy, if I could just have a hundred to six hundred that was fast, 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 I would just move to it instantly. Uh, I'm. I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I love a prime lens. Um, I've always, you know, my, my 400 to 8 is, is my lens of choice. Mm -hmm. I, I love being able to go to 2.8, but, um, and again, I like the 600, but I must admit, um, this Australian Open, I used the 2 to 4 quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I used to, the year before, I used to call the 2 to 400 match point lens. Mm -hmm. So I'd carry around my 400, shoot with the 400, and then just to give myself a bit more room, 
I'd used the two to 400 for match points, so I wasn't cropping anything out. But I did this year, um, yeah, found myself using the two to four a lot more, probably because I was working a different angle. But, um, and I must admit it is growing on me and I'm, I'm amazed at the, the quality that's coming out of the, the, the zoom lenses these days. Um, but yeah, I, I still do like the primes just because I like to really isolate that background. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I guess a, a dream for me would be if they brought out a 200 to 600 2.8. Amazing. That would be amazing. I don't know. I guess maybe that's in the future, and uh, I would love to give that a go. But yeah, I do like being able to have that 2.8. Nice maybe, maybe we could suspend the laws of physics and give it a make it a 1.8. Hey, let's let's go for it. And then yeah. we'd be able to blur out that umpire. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, well, maybe one day you never know. Yeah. Well, now, so as we were talking a little bit about you know what Mike come down the pipeline in the future for the Olympics or whatever, but just in general, you know, imaging technology, what's, what's getting you excited about the world of imaging these days? Uh, well, it probably is that, 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 that the zoom lens is coming on. Um, I, I do like this, um, so we got here the, using the w, um, WR10 to be able to uh, fire off the, uh, the flash. Um, I quite like, you know, being able to put my, put my flash off, off site and using it like that and just the, the ease of, um, of doing it from the way I used to do it with a uh, pocket wizard. So things like that just making my job a lot easier. But um, yeah, definitely sort of uh, makes the ability to create mood with flash a whole lot easier. Mm -hmm. Now, in your presentation, you showed us a 360 degree image from the Australian Open. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you captured that? Uh, yeah, well, I guess that's a new, new technology these days that we, we've started started using. I mean, they're all pretty simple, a one-shot process now, but I think that the hardest thing now is almost to try and keep yourself out of the image. But um, I think probably the industry is still trying to work out exactly how to use them in the industry force, but we are seeing a lot of websites that want, want that ability to be see the full 360 range. Obviously, from what I've found so far, the closer you can get to the action the, the better it works, mm -hmm. but um, yes, I, I guess we're all continually looking for different angles and things, and that's just another, I guess, service we can provide to give give the consumer an, another option. Mm -hmm. So that was with the, the the Nikon Key Mission 360, I take it. That one wasn't actually mine. Uh, oh, okay. I think that was with the Ricoh uh, Theatre Theater S. Oh, okay then. Yeah. So that's have you a, had a chance to play with the Key Mission line? Uh, I've only had a, a quick quick go, and I actually uh, have one in my bag oh, well, at, that's the, good. at the moment. So that's going to be uh, something I'm, I'm excited to have a play around with. Well, they're certainly very unique, yeah. and uh, it's uh, it's something that we know that Getty's interested in because yeah. they've got they sell stock 360 degree imagery. That's right. That's you know, right. So it's yeah. a, it's an area where they're putting their resources. So any uh, ability to capture that sort of content is something that uh, the, you know, the new market of virtual reality is interested in. So with the modern camera shooting faster and faster all the time, and you, you sort of touched on this uh, you know, with frame rate and all these images that you've got to fire off to your editor. And, and so how do you handle the thousands of images that you take? How do you find the needle in the haystack so quickly uh. to get it out and meet your deadline? Ideally, I'm tagging in the back of the camera, okay. so um, that, that's my first priority if I can, but sometimes you might shoot something and it, it might be, it just happens instantly and the first thing I'm doing is just playing it straight in my computer and I'll, I don't even have time to flick through the back and, and tag what I want, I'm just getting into my computer as quick as I can. Uh, Getty has their own uh, program we use called GIFT, so it's, um, it, it assigns uh, a lot of the uh, metadata to the images as, as it's loading through the computer, and it also is a, a very fast uh, filing system, so I can scroll through thousands of images and just with a, a, a click of the uh, keyboard I can tag the pictures I want. Okay. So now, I did a little bit of research uh, in advance of you showing up today, and so it, from what I read, it, it looks like you basically sort of started your photography career in, towards the late 90s. Correct. So you're right at a transition period at that yeah. point. That was just the dying days of film and the early days of digital. It obviously was a crossover period there because, you know, the, the very first digital cameras were you know, suitable for certain jobs, but yeah. not all. And uh, so when did you personally migrate away from film to digital? And is there still any film in your life? Uh, or career. <laughs> I shouldn't admit to this, but there's there's still film in the fridge. 
That's um, all right. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I haven't used it for many years. But uh, yeah, you're right. When when I, when I was going through college, um, obviously we learnt all the black and white skills, and it was all all through film. And um, I worked for a few years in you know a black and white photo lab, and and loved that mm -hmm. that area. And it was actually very sad to see it go to the di digital age. But um, I guess yeah, when it did, you could see why because everything was so fast. Uh, I'm trying to think what my first digital camera was, but I, I soon realised once I was out of college that if I wanted to get a job, that's that's the way, that's the area everywhere was going. So um, I had to migrate to the digital side of things. Um, yeah, like I said, I've, I've still got film in the fridge. I think I've still got some film cameras. I like to keep mm -hmm. all my old mm -hmm. cameras, but um, yeah, they haven't been out for a, for a long time. Well, just uh, full disclosure, film's making quite a comeback. Yeah. We're, we're selling a lot of film at Michael's camera. I mean, is it a fashion statement or, you know, or is it just exploring the love of, you know, the analog process? It's really hard to say, but uh, year on year film sales just keep increasing here yeah. and uh, we're still able to do processing uh, as well. So, uh, you know, sort of a one-stop shop. So back to the, you know this film or you know analog versus digital thing when do you figure it was the light bulb moment in your career when all of a sudden it was digital for your particular job at hand won the war uh, it, it was it was probably just seeing other photographers um, I said I, I used to do a lot of work for, for sporting magazine so uh, I used to work in slides where a lot of the, the way I worked so um, I, I guess it was just being left left behind because I had to go get it processed, um, label it, send it off, and there, there were people out in the field using digital, and, and that was instant, and I just saw it and, and realised that, uh, hey, I, I can't be left behind here. I've, mm -hmm. I've got to move with the time, so... Um, so yeah. it, for you, it was more about the delivery time and delays and... Excellent, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I know you hear people talking about it, that I guess now when we compare to the, the quality, it, it probably wasn't there, but in the editorial world, um, yeah, you know, just having things instantly. Yeah. Is what Time was more important. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And of course, in our museum here, we've got a lot of those early digital cameras and they were used for press photography. Mm -hmm. And some of them didn't produce a very good picture, yeah. but they did it instantly. And that was the game changer. That's right. yeah. You know, no more developing in the hotel sink. <laughs> <laughs> so, you go, yeah. so what are the uh, classic uh, questions, which, uh, you know, a lot of people want to know because they, you know, they, they see your dream job and they're like, well, how could I become a sports yeah. photographer? What, what would you recommend as a, as a path that, uh, uh, you know, a person who's interested in becoming a professional sports photographer, what sort of path should they go down? Uh, well, it's a bit of a cliche, but I would say just keep getting out there and shooting um, and, and, and probably finding events that aren't necessarily covered by other photographers as much. So it might be a, a level down from AFL, so shooting VFL football or TAC under 18 football where the standard's still good and there's good shots to be had. But uh, yeah, mastering your craft there. And, and I think probably an important thing if, if you want to go down that editorial world is probably building up a bit of a, a database of um, editors from the different agencies and newspapers and then I guess sort of um, you know sending them an email with uh, some samples of your work so whether it's a, a small sample of or a link to a, a folio um, and I guess yeah just sort of showing that you know every few months just touching base and sort of showing what your work doing but showing that you're progressing and uh, just getting your name out there uh, it is such a great job that not many people leave so you've got to be a bit patient um, and you've just sort of got to build up and get people used to your name um, yeah and just keep persisting for me it took me many years to break into the industry um, but yeah I, I had that dream kept working um, kept persisting and eventually it became true which would you feel, or is it the you know the the stock standard shots, you know the ones that all the agencies need, or is it the creative shots? Which which you figure would open the door for a you know a new talent? Is okay. it is it is it thinking outside the yeah. box or delivering what everybody else yeah. expects? That, that, that's a very good question. Um, I guess I, I I personally look at a lot of folios that are sent to our editor, especially if they're in Melbourne. My editor might say, oh, you know, have a look at these photos. Tell me what you think of this. Do you know this person? Um, I, I think it's you want to show a range, so you want to show you that you're able to get those stock pictures. Ideally, that you can use light, um, that you understand how the industry is working. You can do some creative shots when need be, because sometimes you're on a job where 
there might not be a picture there and you've got to work hard to create one. So it's important to show that you can do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just giving a broad coverage to show you know sort of the areas that we're looking for. I highly recommend anyone who's uh, watching this interview to uh, go back and watch, if you missed it, the original presentation that Quinn gave so you can see some of his creative work. Uh, he didn't uh, want to dwell on all the simple stuff. He wanted to show us his best and it was fabulous work and he's, he's a master of his light and of uh, you know, get you, you know that quintessential moment, that shadow picture where Thank the you. tennis ball was right where the shadow of the racket was. I mean, just some, some brilliant samples. So there's no doubt about it, uh, you know, uh, being creative is important, but you've also got to show you can do the 99% of the boring stuff as well. So, yeah. yeah. Correct. Uh, no, I guess the last little parting shot I wanted to ask you was, uh, tell us about the uh, shot that got away. It's kind of like a fisherman talking about the fish that got away. <laughs> was, there, was there anything uh, that you just, you, you put all the hours in and it just didn't come together for you? Yeah. Or a shot that maybe is in your mind yeah, that you yeah. just haven't managed to get into the pixels yet? Yeah, there's, uh, there's obviously there's, there's quite a few stories of ones that, that got away. Um, the one that springs to mind when you say that was probably uh, this year, or last year's Rio Olympics um, for the 100 metre final. Um, I got what I thought was a really good gig. I was uh, sort of had a bit of free reign to shoot from the crowd. And they, the only sort of brief was we had, for example, we had I think 17 photographers covering that one race. So we you know, had hopefully every angle covered, but mine was to try and just get a shot that involved the crowd um, and try and get Bolt coming across the finish line. So they gave me a bit of free reign to sort of work the angles. And um, so I, I went up and, and sort of found a spot that I thought that might work. And I actually shot the semi-final and I actually picked out um, a group of crowd who were really celebrating when Bolt crossed the line in the semi-final. And I thought that, yep, that's gonna be my picture. And, I sort of framed it all up correctly and um, I thought, yeah, this, this could work really well. Um, unfortunately, when Bolt crossed the finish line, it was a lot closer than I think everyone anticipated. Um, so the crowd's reaction to him winning was probably delayed until he was 10, 20 metres past the finish line. So the elements didn't all come together. I, I had the crowd going up, but it wasn't in the, the point where I'd hoped Bolt would be crossing the finish line. That happens sometimes. Again, I'd rather go for something different and hope there's a great shot there. We had so many other angles covered that I had that luxury to try something a bit different. It didn't work, but uh, you know, we move on. You can't restage it. That's it, that's it. And that's one of the beauties of sports photography. That's what I love is that it can't be restaged. You either get it or you don't. And that's the thrill, you know, when you do get it, it's a great feeling. And unfortunately, it can't happen every time. Well, I guess uh, one last uh, parting question. What is your favourite sport to photograph? Uh, I, I probably, the real answer to that, this is I like variety. I mm. like the different, you know, variety of shooting, swimming one day, football the other day. Um, but if I had to pick one sport, it's, it's probably swimming. I, I like, as I said, water sports. I like the effects I can get from water. I'm intrigued by it. There's just so many different elements to work with, um, you know, reflections or, um, yeah, things like that. So probably swimming is probably my main passion. Oh, wow. Well, I want to really uh, extend a, a warm thank you for you for uh, coming to Michael's and giving us Thanks, a, a Thanks, wonderful Sean. presentation. Uh, we want to thank uh, Julie from uh, Nikon for uh, sponsoring this and making sure that everything all happened. We got a great crowd out today to, uh, to hear Quinn speak. And of course, he just shows some brilliant work. Uh, I highly recommend if you haven't had a chance to watch the presentation, but you do so. And uh, if you uh, field any questions into our Facebook uh, feeds here, we can be certain to pass them along to Quinn so that uh, he can have a chance to, to answer. And uh, keep uh, an eye out on our Facebook feed. We're going to hopefully be doing a lot more live videos. We really enjoy it. And a, again, big warm thanks to, uh, to Quinn for putting up with us today and uh, trying to uh, make all this technology work. It's a, a boatload of equipment that we've got to uh, use to, to get multi-cameras going live here at Michael's. But we have a lot of fun doing it. And uh, we, uh, we really think that uh, getting the message out live is a brilliant way to bring the photographic stories to our viewers. 
Uh, if you're ever in Melbourne, you've got to come in and visit Michael's camera on Thursdays at lunchtime. We always have presentations and you're more than welcome to attend those. And of course, if you're just passing through Melbourne, you want to stop into Michael's and check out our world famous camera museum. So you can see all the history of film. And uh, of course, if you're in the market for new cameras, we've got everything available here. And we've got a brilliant sales force that is going to be able to fit a camera to your specific needs. And if that means a big honking black Nikon lens that you need to shoot the children's footy, we've got those as well for you. So uh, thank you so much for joining us here on Facebook. And uh, give us a little like, follow us. Uh, we'll probably have uh, this available on YouTube as well in higher resolution. And we look forward to seeing you on the next video. Take care. Thank you. Bye.